Criminal responsibility is at the heart of every conviction. But what happens when more than one person shares the same body? Since the late 1700s, there have been numerous accounts of individuals who appeared to have multiple personalities. Sometimes they didn't seem to even be aware of each other. Today, this disorder is formally recognized as a genuine mental illness. Although it's often called multiple personality disorder, its clinical name is Dissociative Identity Disorder, or DID. When someone with this illness commits a crime, deciding which personality is responsible can pose a significant challenge in a courtroom. It can also be a tempting defense when freedom is at stake and evidence of guilt is overwhelming. Should a person who claims she didn't know about a crime because her alter did it be held responsible for it? On this episode of Unmasking a Murderer, we'll look at the case of Pamela Moss, who in 2013 stood accused of murdering 67-year-old Doug Coker. One expert psychologist said that Moss suffered from dissociative identity disorder, and it was her alter Caroline who committed the murder. Would this diagnosis be enough to get Pamela Moss off the hook for murder? For most of us, spring symbolizes a time of rebirth. It's a season to look forward to when the cold grayness of winter gives way to sunshine and new life. However, in McDonough, Georgia, on the morning of March 13, 2012, the promise of spring gave way to something ominous, something dark. For 67-year-old Doug Coker and his wife, Judy, the day began, as usual, with breakfast together. The self-proclaimed soulmates have been happily married for 30 years, having built the sort of charm life most people dream of. With four grown children and six grandkids, the Cokers were a loving and tight bonded family. They had a lot to look forward to in life. Doug took as much pride in his work as he did in his family, and it had certainly paid off. Despite coming from humble beginnings, he had built a very successful real estate business and was proud of the fact that he had been able to give jobs to people he cared about in the community. Judy and Doug were known for their generosity and the altruistic couple were excited about a new charitable prospect that would help disenfranchised families own their own homes. Six months earlier, nonprofit grant writer Pamela Moss had asked the Cokers if she could help them get their nonprofit off the ground. Doug and Judy happily agreed, and in addition to putting up the money to spearhead the project, they planned on donating a number of their properties to families in need. However, the good-natured couple had recently run into a dilemma. Pamela Moss, the self-proclaimed expert in securing nonprofit grants, had failed to deliver on her promises. Doug had already given her $85,000 to put toward the charity, but had yet to see any progress made. After six months of excuses, Pamela finally agreed to meet with Doug that day to discuss how to move forward. Judy was a little nervous about Doug's meeting with Pamela, but not Doug. He just wanted to get their money back and put the whole thing behind him. When Doug left the house that day, it was the last time Judy Coker would ever kiss her husband goodbye. After attending to his other routine business obligations, Doug Coker made his way to McDonald's in Macon, Georgia to meet with Pamela Moss and get his money back. Judy called to see how the meeting went, but couldn't reach Doug. Hours went by and Judy still couldn't reach her husband. The Cokers spoke often throughout the day. When Judy hadn't heard from her husband, she knew something was terribly wrong. It was completely out of character for him to be out of touch for so long. She worried that he might have had some medical emergency. He had a history of having aneurysms. When the Coker's nephew, also concerned, phoned the Henry County Sheriff's Department and explained the situation, they immediately put out a bolo, be on the lookout for Doug, due to his medical history. Family and friends started canvassing nearby neighborhoods and backcountry. Pretty soon, everyone was involved in looking for Doug. <laughs> 
Police checked Doug's numerous rental properties and tried to track his cell phone. Though it had been turned off, they were able to ping its last location to a cell tower just outside of a McDonald's in Macon County, 57 miles from Doug's home. Fast food restaurant security cameras showed that Doug had been there a little after 11 a.m. He had ordered a coffee, made a phone call, and then scribbled a note on a piece of paper before walking out the door. Cell phone records showed that the last phone call he had made was to Pamela Moss. When investigators talked to Pamela, she was concerned and cooperative. She told them she had called Doug to let him know she was running late for their meeting at McDonald's and had a tight schedule. She pulled into the parking lot, Doug came outside, and they met briefly in the lot before parting ways. At that time, police had no reason to suspect that Moss was not telling the truth. That all changed, though, over the next few days. Pamela began evading investigators and could no longer be located. Suspicions over her connection with Doug's disappearance intensified after a detective stopped by her residence. Although she was nowhere to be found, he stumbled upon what would turn out to be key evidence near one of her garbage cans, a receipt from a Kroger supermarket. The day Doug went missing, Pamela Moss had purchased bleach and industrial cleaning gloves, items commonly used to clean up a crime scene. Time was ticking. Doug Coker had not been seen for four days now, and Pamela Moss was still nowhere to be found. Investigators thought their best shot at talking to her again was to catch her when she was least expecting them, so they paid her another home visit, this time at 11.30 p.m. The house was pitch black when two sheriff's investigators walked up to Pamela's front door. It was eerily silent, no sign of anyone at home. They walked around to check the back of the house and were struck immediately by a foul odor. They immediately recognized it. It was a smell of something dead. After searching around her porch, the two investigators made a grim discovery. There, hidden under a black tarp covered in shingles and lime, was the dead body of 67-year-old Doug Coker, the beloved family man and esteemed member of the community had been discarded and left outside like garbage. When police entered Pamela's house, they discovered a sloppy attempt to cover up a gruesome crime scene. Someone had left the natural gas running from the fireplace and put two lamps on a timer, obviously trying to set the house on fire and burn up the evidence. There was a significant amount of blood evidence, including a large pool in the living room that had been painted over. Much of the spatter had been haphazardly cleaned up with a purchased bleach that was lying around. In the kitchen, investigators found a bloody hammer they suspected to be the murder weapon. Later DNA testing proved it was a match for Doug Coker. Doug's body had been placed next to a large plastic tub that was filled with bloody gloves, plastic sheeting, trash bags, and easy move pads, a device used to move heavy objects. Investigators also found bags of lime nearby, which is typically used for lawn care to reduce odors. Pamela Moss was now a murder suspect. They eventually tracked her down and arrested her at a hospital where she had been admitted for a suicide attempt. Judy Coker was devastated when she heard the tragic news of what had happened to her husband. The kind and generous man that she had built a life with was gone, and Judy had to deal with the horrible way he had died. She couldn't believe that someone she trusted, who was supposed to help her husband give back to the community, could end his life. The nightmare, though, became worse when they discovered that Pamela Moss had, in fact, killed before. In 1996, Pamela Moss, then Pamela Fry, was charged with another murder, that of her own mother, 64-year-old Barbara Sherman Fry. She was accused of poisoning her with an overdose of antidepressants. Prosecutors said the motive was a $500,000 life insurance policy. However, right from the start, the defense thought something was wrong with Pamela. They hired two psychologists to evaluate her. Both hypnotized Pamela and both witnessed the emergence of alters 
or separate personalities with distinct voices and mannerisms. They diagnosed her with multiple personality disorder and told the judge that the real Pamela had no control over her alter's actions. She didn't even remember them. They also reported that Pamela Moss had been sexually abused at age 12 and that one of her alters had memories of even earlier abuse, but couldn't remember details. Taking this into account, the judge allowed her to plead guilty to voluntary manslaughter. In the fall of 1997, Pamela Fry was sent to Pulaski State Prison and served eight years for taking the life of her mother. If only the judge had known at the time that less than a decade later, she would be charged with another murder. This time, Pamela Moss was again going to trial with a plea of not guilty by reason of insanity. According to the prosecution, the story was straightforward. Pamela Moss lured Doug Coker to her house and beat him to death with a hammer to cover up the fact that she had spent the $85,000 he had given her. She had targeted Doug for his wealth and generosity and never had any intention of starting a nonprofit or repaying the Cokers. Pamela's attorneys saw it differently. They again relied on the multiple personality disorder defense, although this disorder is now known as dissociative identity disorder. Dr. Anthony Levitas was hired by Pamela's attorney and testified that while Pamela's body had committed the murder, her mind had not. Instead, he said it was Caroline who killed Doug. Caroline reportedly told the psychologist that she had murdered Doug because they had gotten into a verbal conflict and she had mistakenly thought her life was in danger. Moss recalled as her alter ego Caroline that the day Doug was killed, she heard screaming, and at one point a man was standing over her with what looked like a curtain rod. Feeling threatened, Caroline said, she defended herself and Pamela and hit him, but couldn't recall with what. After that, she said, she simply remembers seeing blood, and blood there was. In other words, she said, she had delusionally, mistakenly believed that Doug Coker was going to hurt Pamela and had killed him in self-defense. But would this defense be enough? Odds looked good after the judge ruled that the jury could not be told about her previous manslaughter sentence during Doug's trial. The problem for Pamela was the crime scene told a very different story from Carolyn's account. And unlike people, evidence doesn't lie. Police investigators discovered countless attempts in Pamela's home to clean up and cover up the bloody attack not to mention her failed effort to burn the place to the ground. Investigators counted over 228 separate bloodstains, much of which had been hastily cleaned or painted over. However, the question wasn't if the body of Pamela Moss killed Doug Coker, but what her state of mind was at the time of the murder. In order for a person to be found not guilty by reason of insanity in a Georgia courtroom, the defendant had to show one of two things. Either she had acted under a delusional compulsion that justified the killing, or she didn't know the difference between right and wrong at the time of the murder. The cleanup attempts clearly suggested that she knew what she did was wrong, but she argued at the time of the murder, she delusionally believed she was protecting herself. The prosecution had their own psychologist. Dr. Darcy Brooks evaluated Pamela and came to a different conclusion. She testified that she found no evidence Pamela acted under delusional compulsion when she killed Doug Coker. Quite the contrary. She talked about the months Pamela spent avoiding Doug when he asked for his money back and the elaborate steps she took to lure Doug to her home, clean up the crime scene, and then evade authorities. She also talked to several of Pamela's friends and family who had been in contact with her the day Doug Coker was killed. None of them could corroborate Caroline was present or notice any changes in Pamela's voice and mannerisms to indicate that she was in an altered state. As her sister said, she was the same old Pam. She also spoke to the psychologist who had diagnosed Pamela Moss years earlier with multiple personality disorder and had treated her for six years. Even he was now rethinking his earlier diagnosis and wondering if he had been duped by a smart and desperate woman 
who had a master's degree in psychology and a lot of motivation to lie. On August 29, 2013, the jury took only 30 minutes to convict Pamela Moss for Doug Coker's murder. She was found guilty and sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. Clearly, this courtroom did not believe that Pamela Moss's altar killed Doug Coker in a misguided attempt to protect the host personality, Pam. The only personality this jury saw in Pamela Moss was that of a killer. Today, many clinicians believe dissociative identity disorder is a genuine but rare illness that is a result of severe childhood trauma. Overdiagnosed by a minority of dissociative identity disorder specialists and unlikely to first surface in the criminal arena. Courts have become increasingly skeptical. Since the 1990s, few DID defenses have been successful. Psychologists in the courtroom are less likely to solely rely on clinical observations and more likely to search for pre existing evidence that supports them. Pamela Moss is a case in point. At the time she first received her multiple personality disorder diagnosis in 1996, no one verified her claims of abuse, asked loved ones if they had ever observed any personality shifts, or checked to see if her records contained prior evidence of dissociation. She was allowed to plead guilty to involuntary manslaughter, even though the facts clearly suggested she deliberately overdosed her mother for a $500,000 insurance payout. In 2012, that strategy failed. Not only did detectives uncover a mountain of evidence suggesting Pamela Moss, not Caroline, planned, executed, and attempted to cover up a murder, a forensic psychologist testified that if Pamela Moss had ever had DID, no one had seen any evidence of it since she stopped treatment in 2003. She also argued that the defendant had given conflicting stories about her mental state at the time of the murder and that someone, even an altar who killed in self-defense, was not likely to hide the body under the porch afterward. The verdict is still out on how often DID appears in the therapist's office, but in the courtroom, most juries demand proof.